This is the illiterate turd skin reading the Aeneid by Virgil, translated by Robert Faggles. A bit of history first. Fleeing the ashes of Troy, Aeneas, Achilles' mighty foe, India Iliad, began an incredible journey to fulfill his destiny. His voyage will take him through stormy seas, entangle him in a tragic love affair, and lure him into the world of the dead itself, all the way tormented by the vengeful Juno, queen of the gods. Ultimately, he reaches the promised lands of Italy, where, after bloody battles and with high hopes, he founds the Roman people. An unsparing portrait of a man caught between love, duty, and fate, the Aeneid redefines passion, nobility, and courage for our times. A bit about the translator, Robert Faggles, whose acclaimed translations of Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, more welcomed as major publishing events, brings the Aeneid to a new generation of readers. Retaining all of the gravitas and humanity of the original Latin, as well as this powerful blend of poetry and myth. Featuring an illuminating introduction to Virgil's word by esteemed scholar Bernard Knox, this volume lends a vibrant new voice to one of the seminal literary achievements of the ancient world. Now, of course, this being a Roman poem, the god Pantheon is... The names have changed, Juno being Hera, Jupiter being Zeus, so on. Anyway, let's get started. Virgil, the Aeneid, Book 1, Safe Haven After Storm. Wars and a man I sing, an exile driven on by fate. He was the first to flee the coast of Troy, destined to reach Lavinian shores in Italian soil. Yet many blows he took on land and sea from the gods above, thanks to cruel Juno's relentless rage. And many losses he bore in battle too, before he could find a city, bring his gods to Latinum, source of the Latin race, the Alban lords, and the high walls of Rome. Muse, how it all began. Why was Juno outraged? What could wound the queen of the gods with all her power? Why did she force a man so famous for his devotion to brave such rounds of hardship, bear such trials? Can such rage inflame the immortals' hearts? There was an ancient city held by Tyrian settlers, Carthage, facing Italy and the Tiber River's mouth, but far away, a rich city trained in fierce in war. Juno loved it, they say. Beyond all other lands in the world, even beloved Samos, second best. Here she kept her armor, here her chariot too, and Carthage would rule the nations of the earth if only the fates were willing. This was Juno's goal from the start, so she nursed her city's strength. But she heard a race of men, sprung of Trojan blood, would one day topple down her Tyrian stronghold, breed an arrogant people ruling far and wide, proud in battle, destined to plunder Libya. So the fates were spinning out the future. This was Juno's fear, and the goddess never forgot the old campaign that she had waged at Troy for her beloved Ar Argos. No. Not even now would the cause of causes of no not even now would the causes of her rage, her bitter sorrows, drop from the goddess's mind. They festered deep within her, galled her still, the judgment of Paris, the unjust slight to her beauty, the Trojan stock she loathed, the honor showered on Ganymede, ravished to the skies, her fury inflamed by all this. The daughter of Saturn drove her endless oceans, Trojans, left by the Greeks and the brute Achilles. Juno kept them far from Latinum, forced by the fates to wander around the seas of the world, year in, year out. Such a long, hard labor it was to found the Roman people. 
Now, with the ridge of Sicily barely out of sight, they spread sail for the open sea, their spirits buoyant, their bronze beaks churning the waves to foam as Juno, nursing deep in her heart the everlasting wound, said to herself, Defeated am I? Give up the fight? Powerless now to keep that Trojan king from Italy? Ah, but of course the fates bar my way. Yet Minerva could burn the fleet to ash and drown my Argive crews in the sea. And all for one, one mad crime of a single man, Ajax, son of Oiles. She hurled Jove's all-consuming bolt from the clouds. She shattered a fleet and whipped the swells with gales. And then as he gasped his last in flames from his riven chest, she swept him up in a cyclone, impaled the man on a crag. But I who walk in majesty, I, the queen of the gods, the sister and wife of Jove, I must wage a war year after year on just one race of men. Who would revere the power of Juno after this? Lay gifts on my altar, lift his hands in prayer? With such anger seething inside her fiery heart, the goddess reached Aeolia, the breeding ground of the storms, their home swarming with raging gusts from the south. Here in a vast cave, King Aeolis ruled the winds, brawling to break free, howling in full gale force as he chains them down in their dungeon, shackled fast. They bluster in protest, roaming round their prison bars with a mountain above them all, booming with their rage. But high in his stronghold, Aeolis wields his scepter, soothing their passions, tempering their fury. Should he fail, surely they'd blow the world away, hurling the land and sea and deep sky through space. Fearing this, the Almighty Father banished the winds to that black cavern, piled above them a mountain mass and imposed on all a king empowered by binding pact to rein them back on command or let them gallop free. Now Juno made this plea to the Lord of Winds. Aeolis, father of the gods and king of men, gave you the power to calm the waves or rouse them to your gales. A race I loathe is crossing the Tuscan Sea, transporting Troy to Italy, bearing their conquered household gods. Thrash your winds to fury, sink their warships, overwhelm them or break them apart, scatter their crews, drown them all. I happen to have some sea nymphs, fourteen beauties, Diopia, the finest of all by far. I'll join you in lasting marriage, call her yours, and for all her years to come she will live with you, and make you the proud father of handsome children. Such service earns such gifts. Aeolis wormed, Aeolis warmed to Juno's offer. Yours is the task, my queen, to explore your heart's desires. Mine is the duty to follow your commands. Yes, thanks to you I rule this humble little kingdom of mine. You won me the scepter, Jupiter's favours too, and a couch to lounge on, set at the gods' feasts. You made me the lord of the storm wind, king of cloudbursts. With such thanks, swinging his spear around as he strikes home at the mountain's hollow flank and out charge the winds through the breach he'd made, like armies on attack in a blasting whirlwind tearing through the earth. Down they crash on the sea, the east wind, the south wind, at all as one with the southwest squalls in hot pursuit. Heaving up from the ocean depths, huge killer breaks rolling toward the beaches. The crews are shouting, cables screeching, suddenly cloud banks blotting out the sky, the light of the day from the Trojan sight, as pitch black night comes brooding down on the sea with thunder crashing pole to pole, bolt on bolt, blazing across the heavens, 
death everywhere, men facing instant death. At once Aeneas, limbs limp in the chill of fear, groans and lifting both his palms towards the stars, cries out, Three, four times blessed, my comrades, lucky to die beneath the soaring walls of Troy before their parents' eyes. If only I'd gone down under your right hand, Diomedes, strongest Greek afield, and poured out my life on the battlefields of Troy. Where raging Hector lies, pierced by Achilles' spear, where mighty Sarpedon lies, where the Simios river swallows down and churns beneath its tides so many shields and helmets and corpses of the brave. Flinging cries as a screaming gust of the north wind pounds against his sail, ra raising waves sky high. The oars shatter, prow twists around, taking the breaker's broadside on and over Aeneas's decks, a mountain of water towers, massive, steep. Some men hang on billowing crests, some as the sea gapes, glimpse through the waves at the bottom waiting, a surge swirl with sand. Three ships the south wind grips and spins against those boulders lurking mid-ocean. Rocks the Italians call the altars, one great spine breaking the surface. Three the east wind sweeps from open sea on the Cerites reef, a grim sight grinding them round with walls of sand. One ship that carried the Lycan units led by staunch Orontes, before Aeneas's eyes, a toppling summit of water strikes the stern and hurls the helmsman overboard, pitching him headfirst, twirling his ship three times right on the spot till the ravenous whirlpool gulps her down. Here and there you can sight some sailors bobbing in the heavy sea, storn in the welter now, the weapons, men, stray spars and treasure saved from Troy. Now Illinois's sturdy ship, now brave Achetes, now the galley that carried Abbas, another aged Eltes, yes, the storm routs them all. Down to the last craft the joints split, beams spring and the lethal flood pours in. All the while Neptune sends the fervor above him, the roaring seas first and the storm breaking next. His standing waters boiling up from the seabed churning back. And the mighty god, stirred to his depths, lifts his head from the crests and serene in power, gazing out over all his realm. He sees Aeneas' squadron scattered across the ocean, Trojans overwhelmed by the surf and the wild crashing skies. Nor did he miss his sister Juno's current nor did he miss his sister Juno's cunning wrath at work. He summons the east and west wind, takes them to task. What insolence! Thrusting so to your lofty birth, you winds, you dare make heaven and earth a chaos, rising a right of waves without my blessings. You, what I won't do, but first I had better set to rest the flood you ruffled so. Next time, trust me, you will pay for your crimes with more than just a scolding. Away with you, quick, and give your king this message. Power over the sea and the ruthless trident is mine, not his. It's mine by lot, by destiny. His place, Easterwind, is the rough rocks where you are all at home. Let him bluster there and play the king in his court. Let Aeluis, let Aeluis rule his blotted dungeon of the winds. Quicker than his command he calms the heaving seas, putting the clouds to rout and bringing back the sun. Struggling shoulder to shoulder, Triton and Simothe hoist the heaves the ships from the jagged rocks, as the god himself whisks them up with his trident. Clearing a channel through the deadly reefs, his chariot skimming over the cresting waves on spinning wheels to set the seas to rest. Just as all too often, some huge crowd is seized by the vast uprising. The rabble rocks. The rabble runs amok. All slaves to passion, rocks, firebrands flying. Rage finds them, arms, but then 
if they by if rage finds them arms but then if they chance to see a man among them one whose devotion and public service lend him weight they stand there stock still with their ears alert as he rules their fervor with his words and calms their passion so the cash of the breakers all fall silent once their father so the crash of the breakers all fall silent once their father gazing over his realm under clear skies flicks his horses giving them free rein and his eager cherry flies now bone weary aeneas's shipmates make a run for the nearest landfall wheeling prows around they turn for libya's coast there is a he heaven shaped by an there is a heaven shaped by an island shielding the mouth of a long deep bay its flanks to breaking by the force of combers pounding in from the sea while drawing them off into calm receding channels both sides of the harbor harbors rock cliffs tower crowned by twin crags that menace the sky overshadowing reaches of sheltered water quiet and secure over them as a backdrop looms over a quivering wood over them as a backdrop looms a quivering wood above them rears a grove bristling dark with shade and fonting the cliff a cave under hanging rocks with fresh water inside seats cut in the native stone the home of nymphs never a need of cables here to moor a weathered ship no ankle with biting flukes to bind her fast Aeneas puts in here with a bare seven warships saved from his whole fleet. How keen their longing for dry land underfoot as the Trojans disembark, taking hold of the earth, their last best hope, and fling their brine-racked bodies on the sand. A Achates is first to strike a spark from flint, and then works to keep it alive in dry leaves, cups it around with kindling, feeds it chips, then briskly fans the tinder into flame. Then, spent as they were from all their toil, they set out food, the bounty of Ceres, drenched in sea salt, Ceres' utensils too, her mills and troughs, and bent bend to parch with fire the grain they had salvaged, grind it fine into stones. Grind it fine on stones. While they see to their meal, Aeneas scales a crag, straining to scan the sea reach far and wide. Is there any trace of Antheus now, tossed by the gales, or his warship, banked by oars? Or Capis, perhaps, or Cassius, stern, adorned with shields, not a ship in sight. But he does spot three stags roaming the shore. An entire herd behind them grazing down the glens in a long ranked line. He halts, grasps his bow with his flying arrows, the weapons his trusty aid Achates keeps at hand. First the leaders, antlers branching over their high heads, he brings them down, then turns on the herd his shafts stampeding the rest like rabble into the leafy groves. Shaft on shaft, no stopping him till he stretches seven hefty carcasses on the ground, a triumph, one for each of his ships, and makes for the cove, divides the kill with his whole crew, then shares out the wine that good Asketis, princely man, had brimed in their casks the day they left Sicilian shores. The commander's words relieve their stricken hearts. My comrades, hardly strangers to pain before now, we all have weathered worse. Some god will grant us an end to this as well. You've threaded the rocks resounding with Scylla's howling rabid dogs, and taken the brunt of the Cyclops' boulders too. Call up your courage again, dismiss your grief and fear. A joy it will be one day, perhaps, to remember even this. 
Through so many hard straits, so many twists and turns, our course holds firm for Latinum. There fate holds out, a homeland calm at peace. There the gods decree the kingdom of Troy will rise again. Bear up, save your strength for better times to come. Brave words. Sick with mounting cares, he assumes a look of hope and keeps his anguish buried in his heart. The men grind up, the men gird up for the game, the coming feast. They skin the hide from the ribs, lay bare the meat. Some cut it into quivering stiff strips. Some cut it into quivering strips, impale it on skewers. Some set cauldrons along the beach and fire them to the boil. Then they renew their strength with food, stretched out on the beach grass, fill themselves with seasoned wine and venison, rich and crisp. Their hunger sated, the tables cleared away, they talk on for hours, asking their missing shipmates, wavering now between hope and fear. What to believe about the rest? Were men still alive, or just in the last throes of death? Forever lost to their comrades, far-flung calls. Aeneas, most of all, devoted to his shipmates, deep within himself he moans for the losses. And now Orontes, hardy shoulder. Now Orontes, hardy soldier. Now for Amicus. Now for the brutal fate that Lycus may have met. Then Gaius and brave Cloanthus, hearts of oak. Their mourning was over now as Jove from high heaven, gazing down on the sea, the white capped, the white caps winged with sails, the lands outspread, the coasts, the nations of the earth, paused at the zenith of the sky, and set his sights on Libya, that proud kingdom. All at once, as he took to heart the struggles he beheld, Venus approached in rare sorrow, tears abrim in her sparkling eyes, and begged, Oh, you who rule the lives of men and gods with your everlasting laws and your lightning bolt of terror, what crime could my Aeneas commit against you? What dire harm could the Trojans do that, after bearing so many losses, this wide world is shut to them now? All because of Italy. Surely from then the Romans would arise one day, as the years roll on, and leaders would as well, descended from Tecur's blood, brought back to life to rule all the lands and seas with boundless power. You promised, father. What motive changed your mind? With that, at least I consoled myself for Troy's demise and heart-rending ruin. Wait, fate. With that, at least I consoled myself for Troy's demise, that heart-rending ruin weighing fate against fate but now after all my trojans suffered still the same disastrous fortune drives them on and on what end great king do you set to their ordeals and tenor could slip out from under the greek siege and then make his passage to the ilian gruffs and safe through the inlands where the Liburnian's rule. He struggled past the Tivmaus River source. There, through its nine mouths, as the mountain caves roar back, the rivers burst out into full flood, a thundering surf that overpowers the fields. Reaching Italy, he erected a city for his people, a Trojan home called Padua. He gave them a Trojan name, hung up their Trojan arms, and there, after long wars, he lingers on in serene and settled peace. But we, your own children, the ones who you swore would hold the battlements of heaven, now our ships are lost, appalling. We are abandoned, thanks to the rage of a single foe, cut off from Italy's shores. Is this our reward for reverence? Is this the way you give us back our throne? The father of men and gods, smiling down on her with the glance that clears the sky and calms the tempest, lightly kissing his daughter on the lips, replied, 
relieve yourself of fear, my lady of Scythera. The fate of your children stands unchanged, I swear. You will see your promised city, see Lavinum's walls, and bear your great-hearted Aeneas up to the stars on high. Nothing has changed my mind. No, your son, believe me, since anguish is gnawing at you, I will tell you more, unscrolling the scroll of fate, to reveal its dark secrets. Aeneas will wage a long, costly war in Italy, crush defiant tribes and build high city walls for his people there, and found the rule of law. Only three summers will see him govern Latinum. Three winters pass in barracks after the Latins have been broken. But his son, Ascanius, now that he gains the name of Ilius, Ilius he was, while Ilum ruled on high, will fill out his own reign, thirty sovereign years, a, gi a giant cycle of months revolving round and round, transferring his rule from its old Lavinian home to raise up Alba Longa's mighty ramparts. There, in turn, for a full three hundred years, the dynasty of Hector will hold sway, till Ilia, a royal priestess great with the blood of Mars, will bear the twin. There, in turn, for a full three hundred years, the dynasty of Hector will hold sway till Ilia, a royal priestess, great with the brood of Mars, will bear the god twin sons. Then one, Romulus, reveling in a tawny pelt of a wolf that nursed him, will inherit the line and build the walls of Mars, and after his own name, call his people Romans. On them I have set no limits, space or time. I have granted them power, empire, without end. Even furious Juno, now plaguing the land and sea and sky with terror, she will mend her ways and hold dear with me these Romans, lords of the earth, the race arrayed in togas. This is my pleasure, my decree. Indeed an age will come as the long years slip by, when the Aceracus royal house will quell Achilles' homeland, brilliant Mycia too, and enslave their people, rule defeated Argos. From that noble blood will arise a Trojan Caesar, his empires bound by the ocean, his glory by the stars. Julius, a name passed down from Ilius, his great forebearer. And you, in years to come, you will welcome him to the skies, and rest assured, laden with plunder of the east. And he with Aeneas will be invoked in prayer. There will the violent creatures, then will the violent centuries, battle set aside, grow gentle, kind. Vesta and silver haired. Vesta and silver-haired good faith and Romulus flanked by brother Remus will make the laws. The terrible gates of war with their welded iron bars will stand bolted shut and locked inside. The frenzy of civil strife will crouch down on his savage weapons, hands pinioned behind his back with a hundred brazen shackles monstrously roaring out from his bloody jaws. So he decrees and speeds the son of Maya down the sky to make the lands and the new stronghold, Carthage, open in welcome to the Trojans, not let Dido, unaware of fate, expel them from her borders. Down through the vast, clear air flies Mercury, rowing his wings like oars and in a moment stands on Libya's shores, 
obeys commands, and the will of the god is done. The Carthaginians calm their fiery temper, and Queen Dido, above all, takes to heart a spirit of peace and warm goodwill to meet the men of Troy. But Aeneas, duty-bound, his mind restless with worries all that night, reaches a firm resolve as the fresh day broke. Out he goes to explore the strange terrain. What coast had the storm winds brought him to? Who lives here? All he sees is wild, untilled. What men or what creatures? Then report the news to all his comrades. So concealing his ships in the sheltered woody narrows overreached in the sheltered woody narrows, overarched by rocks and screened around by trees and trembling shade, Aeneas moves out, with only Achates at his side, two steel-tipped javelins balanced in his grip. Suddenly, in the heart of the woods, his mother crossed his path. She looked like a young girl, a Spartan, decked out in dress and gear, or Thracian Harlepis, tiring out her mares, outracing a herbis river's rapid tides, hung from a shoulder a bow that fit her grip, a huntress for all the world. She'd let her curls go streaming free in the wind, her knees were bare, her flowing skirts hitched up in a tight knot. She speaks out first, You there, young soldiers, did you by chance see one of my sisters? Which way did they go? Roaming the woods a quiver, slung from her belt, wearing a spotted lynx skin, or in full cry, hot on the track of some great frothing boar. So Venus asked, the son of Venus answered, Not one of your sisters have I seen or heard, but how should I greet a young girl like you? Your face, your feature, hardly a mortal's looks. And the tone of your voice is hardly human either. Oh, a goddess without a doubt. What, are you Apollo's sister, or one of the breed of nymphs? Be kind, whoever you are. Relieve our troubled hearts. Under what skies and onto what coasts of the world have we been driven? Tell us, please. Castaways we know nothing. Not the people, not the place. Lost. Hurled here by the gales and heavy seas. Many a victim will fall before your altars. We'll slaughter them for you. But Venus replied, Now there's an honor I don't really deserve. It's just the style for Tririan girls to sport a quiver and high-laced hunting boots in crimson. What you see is a Punic kingdom, the people of Tyr and Agon Agonor's town, but the borders held by Libyans hard to break in war. Phoenician Dido is in command. She sailed from Tyr in flight from her own brother. Oh, it's a long tale of crime, long, twisting, dark. But I'll try to trace the high points in their order. Dido was married to Sicaeus, the richest man in Tyr, and she, poor girl, was consumed with love for him. Her father gave her away, wed for the first time, a virgin still, and these her first solemn rites. But her brother held power in tear. Pygmalion, a monster, the vilest man alive. A murderous feud broke out between both men. Pygmalion, catching Sicaeus off guard at the altar, slaughtered him in blood. That unholy man, so blind in his lust for gold, he ran him through with a sword, then hid the crime for months, deaf to his sister's love and their heartbreak. Still he mocked her with the wicked lies, empty hopes, but she had a dream one night. The true ghost of her husband, not yet buried, came and lifting his face ashen, awesome in death, showed her the cruel altar the wounds that pierced his chest, and exposed the secret horror that lurked within the house. He urged her on, Take flight from our homeland, quick! And then he revealed an unknown ancient treasure, an untold weight of silver and gold, a comrade to speed her on her way. 
Driven by all this, Dido plans her escape, collects her followers fired by savage hate of the tyrant or bitter fear. They see some galleys set to sail, load them with gold, the wealth Pygmalion craved. Then, and they bear it overseas, and a woman leads them all, reaching his, reaching this haven here, where now you will see the steep ramparts rising, the new city of Carthage. The Tyrians purchased lands as large as the bulls, as large as a bull's hide could enclose but cut up in strips for size and called it Birsa, the hide, for the spread they'd bought. But you, who are you? What shores do you come from? Where are you headed now? He answered her questions, drawing a labored sigh from deep within his chest. <sighs> Goddess, if I'd retraced our story to its start, if you'd had time to hear the saga of our ordeals, before I finished the evening star would close the gates of Olympus, put the day to sleep. From old Troy we come. From old Troy we come. Troy, it's called. Perhaps you've heard of the name. Sailing over the world's seas until, by chance, some whim of the wind, some tempest, drove us on to Livian shores. I am Aeneas, duty bound. I carry aboard my ships the gods of house and home we seize from enemy hands. My fame goes past skies. I seek my homeland, Italy, born as I am from the highest Jove. I launched out on the Fyrian sea with twenty ships, my goddess mother marking the way and followed hard on the course the fates had charted. A mere seven, battered by wind and wave, survived the worst. I myself am a stranger, utterly at lost, trekking over this wild Libyan wasteland, forced from Europe, Asia too, an exile. Venus could bear no more of his laments and broke in on his tale of endless hardship. Whoever you are, I scarcely think the powers hate you. You enjoy the breath of life, you've reached a Tyrian city. So off you go now. Take this path to the Queen's gates, I have good news. Your friends are restored to you, your fleets reclaimed. The f wind swerved from the north and drove them from safe to port. True, unless my parents taught me to read the flights of birds for nothing. Look at the dozen swans. Look at the look at those dozen swans, triumphant in formation. The eagle of Job had just swooped down on them all from Haven's heights and scattered them into open sky. But now you can see them flying trim in their long ranks, landing or looking down where their friends have landed. Home, caravoting on ruffling wings and wheeling round the sky on convo, trumpeting in their glory, so homeward bound, your ships and hardy shipmates anchor in port now, or approach the harbor's mouth. Full sail ahead. Now off you go now. Move on. Wherever the path leads you, steer your steps. At that, as she turned away, her neck shone with a rosy glow. Her mane of hair gave off an ambrosial fragrance. Her skirt flowed loose, rippling down to her feet, and her stride alone revealed her as a goddess. He knew her at once, his mother and called after her now as, he, as she sped away. Why, you too cruel as the rest, so often you ridicule your son with your disguises? Why can't we clasp hands, embrace each other, exchange some words, speak out and tell the truth? Reproving her so, he makes his way towards town, but Venus screens the travellers off with a dense mist pouring round them a cloak of clouds with all her power. So no one could see them, no one could reach and hold them, 
caused them to linger now or ask why they had come. But she herself, lifting into air, wings her away towards Paphos, racing with joy to reach her home again, where her temples stand and a hundred altars steam with Arabian incense, redolent with the scent of fresh-cut wreaths. Meanwhile, two men are hurrying on their way as the path leads, now climbing a steep hill arching over the city, looking down on the facing walls and high towers. Aeneas marvels at its mass, wants a clutter of huts. He marvels at gates and bustling hum and cobbled streets. The Tyrians press on with the work, some aligning the walls, struggling to raise the citadel. Trundling stones up slopes, some plick picking the building sites and plowing out their boundaries. Others drafting laws, electing judges, a senate held in awe. Here they're drudging a harbor, where they lay foundations deep for a theater. Carrying, quarrying out of rock great columns to form a fitting scene for stages still to come. As hard as their tasks as bees in early summer that work the blooming meadows under the sun, they escort a new brood out. Young adults now or press the oozing honey into the combs, the nectar brimming the bulging cells, or gather up the plunder, workers haul back in or close ranks like an army, driving the drones, that lazy crew from home. The hive seeds with life, exhaling the scent of honey sweet with thyme. And that will end part one of book one of The Aeneid by Virgil. Thank you for listening. Hope to see you next time.